be, does become a servant. So this dramatic movement from Christ Jesus being in the form of God to taking on the form of a servant gives you a sort of before and after. Not that he ceases to become God in the incarnation, but there is definitely an implication of pre-existence, of a prior existence in the form of God. Secondly, enclosed within this dramatic movement from being in the form of God to taking on as well the form of a servant is how this takes place. And here, the key statement is that he emptied himself. He emptied himself, making himself nothing. The crucial element here is the description of Jesus' action as a voluntary act. As you can see from the verb, he emptied himself. It's not the Father emptying him, but he himself doing this as his own action. So he's not merely the passive envoy of the Father, not merely someone who's been sent by the Father against his own will, but he is one who himself undertakes to take on human flesh in the Incarnation. Now, some scholars have raised questions about whether you can really see pre-existence in Philippians 2 here. Uh, According to one scholar, Jerome Murphy O'Connor, he writes, a surprise awaits anyone who dispassionately looks at the evidence. I always be suspicious when people say, you know, uh, the key to this is looking at the evidence dispassionately and objectively. I mean, who'd want to read the Bible dispassionately anyway? (laughs) Um, And similarly, James Dunn questions whether you can uh, really see pre-existence in this. Neither of them, though, I think, take seriously this dramatic movement from being in the form of God to Jesus emptying himself to taking on human flesh. As, uh, t- as Tom Wright, in his much better account of Philippians 2 here, has said, no mere personification, but a person, a conscious individual entity, is envisaged. The pre-existent son regarded equality with God not as excusing him from the task of suffering and death, but actually as uniquely qualifying him for that vocation. So we have in Philippians 2 active personal pre-existence. Active in the sense that Jesus is in the form of God and then acts to become incarnate and personal because it's not that he's a a sort of mysterious uh, cosmic principle who becomes incarnate in Jesus, but he is a mysterious eternal person who becomes incarnate in Christ Jesus. The second passage that I'd just like to mention in this respect is from 2 Corinthians 8. Uh, All the passages that I'm going to refer to, I hope, are on on the handout. Uh, The second one under this heading of active personal pre-existence. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Though he was rich, he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Again, a clear indication of pre-existence here because of the implication of a prior state of the pre-incarnate son, the eternal son, being rich. In other words, as is probably uh, paralleled in John 17, uh, John 17 you have the reference to the son talking about the glory that I had with you, Father, before the world began. Probably a similar idea here in 2 Corinthians 8 that uh, Christ is in possession of the riches of the glory of glorious fellowship with the Father in eternity, uh, but gives up that uh, eternal fellowship in heaven to take on human flesh and die. Uh, here, the becoming poor is probably not just a reference to the incarnation, but a reference to death as well. Here, as often in, uh, in the statements where Paul is talking about the salvation that Christ brings, he sort of brings the incarnation and the cross very closely together. In the, same, in the same saying uh, as in Philippians 2 as well. You can see that both Philippians 2 and 2 Corinthians 8 are good examples of this. The pre-incarnate Christ coming to be incarnate and to die. Secondly, on Paul, Christ is represented not only as a saviour who has come from eternal existence it, with the Father, but actually as a co-creator with with the Father in eternity. Now, one of the most uh, striking passages in this respect is 1 Corinthians 8, chapter 6. And here, Paul gives a certain interpretation of 
what was known as the Shema, uh, an interpretation which would have been shocking to his Jewish contemporaries. Now, the Shema was the daily, uh, daily confession recited by Jews coming from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. One of the classic statements about uh, divine unity, about God being one person. Now, if you bear in mind that statement, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, then looking at 1 Corinthians 8.6 gives you an interesting uh, spin on that original Deuteronomy saying, where Paul refers to one God, the Father, from whom all things come, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things come, and through whom we live. So the one God who is the one Lord in Deuteronomy 6 is sort of, people use the technical term bifurcated, almost sort of split up. Again, it's, a sort of, uh, Im- it's an imprecise word. But the, the one God, the one Lord of the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament as the Father and the Lord who is the Son, both of whom are actively, were actively involved in creation. This, of course, is an idea that is shared uh, not only elsewhere in Paul, but also by John's Gospel, the Epistle to the Hebrews, uh, and uh, elsewhere in the New Testament. So it's striking that Paul doesn't identify Jesus purely as uh, a saviour who comes in the end, but as the creator who was there in the beginning. And a parallel to this can be seen in Colossians 1 as well, uh, in the statement, because in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, things seen and unseen, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. So the phenomenal scope is, is, uh, is, is, is what Paul is trying to get across in Colossians 1 here. Everything, things seen, unseen, principalities and powers, all things in heaven and on earth, all these were created, not only by the Father, but also through the agency of the eternal Son. So, as with 1 Corinthians 8 here, we have very strong evidence for the pre-existence of Christ. Thirdly and finally on Paul, Christ and Israel, where I start off by mentioning the much-discussed reference and very mysterious reference in 1 Corinthians 10 uh, to the rock that was with, with, uh, <laughs> that was with Israel in the wilderness being Christ. What Paul is saying here is that when Moses struck the rock and provided uh, water for Israel in the the wilderness, in the book of Numbers, it was in fact not merely an impersonal rock who was providing the water, but Christ himself who was providing sustenance for the nation of Israel in that particular situation. And Paul's argument doesn't really work if it's not Christ who's providing the water and I'm, I'm not going to go into detail in the, into the argument of 1 Corinthians 10 as a whole here but uh, in 1 Corinthians 10 Paul is arguing that just as the Israelites had Christ with them in the wilderness so also the, the, the Corinthians who Paul is writing to should watch out because having Christ with them didn't save the uh, Israelites, didn't prevent them from being overthrown so the Corinthians as well should watch out and watch their lives so that they're not destroyed like the Israelites were. The Corinthians shouldn't fall into the same trap, and so Paul says it then in verse 9, that we should not test Christ as some of them did. We should not test Christ as some of those Israelites did. Not that the Israelites were uh, simply testing God the Father, who was Yahweh in, in, uh, in the Old Testament. The Israelites were testing the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Eternal Father, Eternal Son. So, the divine Christ really was a part of Israel's history. So, that's Paul's letters being full of pre-existence, even in this early stage uh, of New Testament history, of earliest Christian history. Thirdly, How's everyone doing? Everyone still, still with me? Good. Thirdly, 
There are strong indications in Matthew, Mark and Luke in the synoptic gospels.